Hey there, welcome to Tega. My name is John Seymour. You may recognize that name from the previous slide, where it refers to me as an adjunct professor at Clemson University in the Graphic Communications Department. I also have my own consulting business known as John the Math Guy. I got into the printing business in 1992. Uh, I was lucky enough at that time to get a research position in a very large printing company. Uh, you may have heard of Quad Graphics. There was a little mom and pop operation. Uh, at the time, it was about uh, one or two billion dollars in sales a year. I was lucky because I was doing research. I didn't have to do any actual work. And I was also lucky because I had access to so many people who were in the printing business for many years. They were experts in what they were doing. I had access to them. I could go talk to them, ask them questions, and really that was part of my job. So it was a pretty good, pretty cool setup. Now, let me point out that these folks are practitioners. They're experts. They know how to run the press. They know how to get product out the door. But they were not scientists. A practitioner is interested in getting the job done. And scientists are not so much interested in getting anything done ever. They're interested in trying to understand why and how things work. One of the things that I learned from these expert printers is the difference between uncoded and coded stock. In particular, the difference in how it prints. If you print on an uncoded stock, you get kind of a washed out color. You don't get as rich a density as you do on coded stock. Naturally, I asked the question, why? When I asked the printing experts why this happened, the explanation had to do with the amount of ink take up, the amount of ink that is transferred to the paper. They told me that an uncoated stock will give you less ink than a coated stock. The coated stock will pick up a lot more ink and hence will have a higher density. Well, that's something we can test. I've got two pieces of paper here. One of them is normal printing paper. It's a matte stock. And the other one is the type of paper that you use to print photos, a very glossy stock. I'm gonna put both of these in my home printer here. You'll notice when I did that, that I didn't make any changes. One sheet, the next sheet. The printer has no idea which sheet is coded and which one is not. And furthermore, it's an inkjet printer. It spits the ink out and the ink goes on the paper and unless it drips someplace, you know that all of the ink got there. So this is an ideal way to test because we're going to be putting down the same amount of ink in both cases to test whether it's ink take up that makes the big difference. So what am I going to print? I went to my graphic arts department and I had them draw up this graphic for me. Um, I think the, I think that this is an awesome graphic. Uh, it cost me about $300 for them to draw that up. So I'm real happy with that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use the PowerPoint facility here to, uh, uh, let's see, file, I go to, and then I say print, and I want page five, and I wanna make two copies of it here. Okay, so here I'll print it. There's my two pieces of paper, Tagorox on coated stock and Tagorox on uncoated stock. From here, it's kind of hard to tell the difference, if there is any difference in density. So let me take a bit closer look. So I had my mechanical department build me a black box. As you can see, the box is black and it's painted black on the inside and all but one side it's light tight so you can't see what's going on uh, back here we have a flashlight and there we have the two prints that we just made
There I turn on the flashlight, and I'm going to position my camera so that I can see those. One thing that we'll notice right away is that there's a difference in the blackness between the two. This one is a grayer color than this here. The one above is, is actually black. And as you can see, that's the one that's glossy. That's the photographic paper. So there is actually a difference. There's no difference in the amount of ink that was printed on them. As you saw coming out of my printer, one came right after the other. The printer doesn't know what type of paper was in it. Both of them got the same amount of ink. And one of them is grayer. So I think we've established pretty clearly now that it isn't a matter of how much ink the paper takes up. That may be part of it, but certainly it's not the whole story. Here's something that's interesting though. I'm going to move my camera to a different angle and all of a sudden we see something interesting. Notice that that gloss there is moving across. You don't see that gloss on the uncoated stock. Well, duh, I think we kind of know that. But now Here's a thought question. Look at the G in Tega. What color is it? Well, we know it's black, right? We printed it with black ink. We looked at it before. But right now, at this angle, it's not black. It's white. Hang on to that thought. That's a clue as to what's really going on here. So I talked to a different pressman and got his take on it. And he told me that it wasn't so much the amount of ink that was taken up by the paper. He said that the ink that's taken up on the uncoated stock seeps into the paper, so some of the pigment is hiding behind the paper fibers. Oh, okay, that makes sense. Let's see if we can test that. It's time to get up close and personal with that uncoated stock that we printed with Tega previously. Here's the setup. This novel thing in the center here is an optical microscope. It's USB connected. Awesome. Awesome device. And behind that is the flashlight that we were using before. And for some odd reason I decided to put the microscope on top of a Lazy Susan. We'll see how that works later. Here's the microscope's eye view. I'm going to zoom in a little bit. And here we are at the full zoom of my camera. This looks like we have identified the problem. We see all kinds of white spots on this supposedly solid black area. Those white spots are probably, I mean, it seems that those spots are where the ink didn't take. So this area appears to not be fully covered by the black ink. I've heard Pressman refer to this as pinholing. In other words, there are areas where the uncoated stock just doesn't take the ink. So you see these little pinholes. From the picture we looked at before, it kind of looked more like hills and valleys, that the surface of the paper, the uncoated stock, has ups and downs to it, hills and valleys, and that the hills maybe are taking the ink uh, and the valleys are not, or maybe it's the other way around that the, the ink seeps down into the valleys, uh, whichever, the hills and valleys, the texture of the paper perhaps is causing an uneven lay down of the ink. The end result is that when the eye blurs things together, you see a combination of black and white, so you get a more gray color than you would if you had solid coverage over the whole thing. That's the theory. Okay, this may sound a bit weird, but uh, go along with me a little bit for a while. Let's just say that we took that uh, uncoated stock with a black ink on it, and then we added a thin layer of varnish. Uh, clear varnish, and make sure that it's a glossy varnish. So what we're going to do is we're going to change the glossiness, but I'm going to put it on top so that it doesn't affect anything underneath. Uh, it's not going to pull ink from out behind the fibers to make the ink richer. It's not going to move ink from the hills to the valleys or anything like that. 
the ink is still going to be where it was. So uh, the prediction would be that if those are the causes for uncoated stock to have a lower density, then we would not see any change in richness at all. The density would remain the same when I put that clear layer of glossy varnish on top. Let's see what happens. I'm going to go get some varnish. Oh, okay, so I ran to the hardware store and I picked up a can of this polyurethane. It's a clear gloss polyurethane. Now, I'm going to put it on top of the uncoated paper that has black ink on it. And if everything, if all the explanations that we've seen before make sense, uh, the polyurethane is not going to pull the pigment out from behind the fibers. It's not going to add any more pigment to it. It's clear, right? Uh, so we should see very little change in the appearance, except that it's going to get glossier. I'm back in my black box recording studio here. There's my sheet of uncoated stock. And I have the polyurethane clear gloss. And I have a paintbrush. And I'm just going to uh, take a little bit of it and see what happens here. I think we've got a problem here, Houston. What's the problem, you say? It looks like the polyurethane varnish has soaked through the paper. And just to show you the problem that causes, I'll take a sheet of white paper and put it underneath. We see that that paper is now quite translucent, and the color that you see depends a lot on what's underneath it. This is not a good way to test this experiment. Okay, second try here. I've got now a piece of plastic. This is the kind of plastic that you put up for a garage sale sign. I put some flat black paint on it and let that dry overnight. You'll notice that as I move it here along the light, there is just a tiny amount of sheen to it, but it is a pretty flat black. Next step. I'm going to do that same thing with the varnish. Oh my goodness. I grew up in a house that was painted a pale green, a matte pale green on the outside. And I remember as a young kid, maybe about six years old, I was pondering about the difference between gloss and matte and what effect that had on the photons bouncing off of it. And I decided I'd try an experiment, basically the same experiment. I got a bucket of water and I found a paintbrush and I started painting the outside of the house with the water. And I noticed that until the water dried, it had developed a much richer color. When I put the water on, the color popped. And then as it dried, the color went away. Well, there happened to be a guy walking by at this time and he ran into the house or ran, knocked on the door and got my mother because uh, he thought I was really painting the house. And <laughs> once I explained to him the whole idea of matte reflections, uh, he, I think he basically understood what I was doing. I didn't get into trouble. But the basic thing remains that when you change a surface from matte to gloss, you change the way the surface reflection behaves. And as a result, you have a significant change in color just because of the change in gloss. Now the lazy Susan comes into play. Consider this now. The sample itself is sitting on the stage of the microscope. The stage of the microscope is sitting on the lazy Susan. So as I rotate the lazy Susan around, the video, which is part of the microscope, is not moving with respect to the sample. The sample is staying where it is. So there should be very little change in the image, in the position of the image. Now, what is changing? What is changing is that the light, 
with respect to the sample is changing. It's as if the, the light was rotating around the sample. Let's see what that looks like. That's all the way around almost. I'm going to come back now. And there's our starting position. I'm going to go back to that Lazy Susan experiment. Here we have the video. Now the Lazy Susan comes into play. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's the one. Let me orient you on this image here. Picture yourself that the screen itself, you're looking at a screen right now, that picture that that screen is actually the surface of that ink. And imagine you are... Uh, holding a flashlight above your head and pointing it toward the screen. Uh, put it in, the, in your right hand just to make sure that uh, we have this uh, correct. Now, you notice that there's a lot of white spots here. Here's a long one here. There's a big one. There's a prominent one in here. This one is kind of prominent as well. There's all kinds of these white spots. Um, why are they white? These are surface reflections that happen because the surface of the black ink is oriented toward the flashlight from your eye. Okay, so uh, it's tilted somewhat backward. Uh, this area here, this is uh, another way to say that this is kind of like a top of a paper fiber that's been uh, painted with that black ink. Let's move ahead in this uh, example here. Uh, we got about halfway through the video and things start changing. Let me Okay, here we've changed just a slight amount. We go from this frame to this frame. Uh, what's happening at this point is the flashlight that's in your hand is rotating. In other words, you're moving your right arm down. You're keeping it the same distance from your head, but you're moving it downward to get into this position. And now the positions on the sample that used to be oriented toward the flashlight um, since the flashlights move, they are not in that position. Other positions on the sample are uh, at that critical angle. So we see that things are moving around a little bit. I'll go between these two again. What we're seeing is that the glint is moving. And there the glint's moved quite a bit, but Okay, here we can see perhaps there's fibers this way. The light is now uh, off to the right a little bit and upward. It's not fully straight uh, east from here. Now we're close to being east. And we move around. Here we're now coming toward the lighting from the bottom. We see these fibers here are oriented in that direction. And so we see that the white spots that we thought were pinholes or areas that didn't take ink are actually glint. Those white spots in the image are not pinholes and they're not areas where the paper did not take up the ink. Those are areas where the surface of the ink is oriented such that you can see the specular light. Let's look back at another video sequence here. This is when we first started so looking. So I had my mechanical oh, department build. Sorry. This is where we're looking inside of that black box. And here we see the uh, two pieces of paper. The uncoated one is here. The coated one is here. I want to move ahead to when we started playing with that. Okay, here we've tilted back the camera. And we now notice the glint. This is the specular reflection that we see. Over here we don't. This particular surface, the light is coming in here at about 45 degrees. 
If we take the angle from the flat surface here up to that, it's about 45 degrees. And the camera is similarly at about 45 degrees. So in this area here, we have a straight line between the light to the surface and to the camera. And that's why we see the glint. Over here, the light that's coming in is hitting here, and it's going off someplace over here where the camera can't see it. That's why we see glint in this region, but not in this. Fundamentally, in terms of the physics that's going on, there's no difference between the white areas here that show the uncoated stock with black ink on it and the white area here that is coated stock with black ink. This area is white because it is oriented at such an angle that we can see the specular reflection. This area here is white because the flashlight is oriented at such an angle that we can see the specular reflection. Same thing. The only difference between these two is that this is a microscopic image and this is not. Being a microscopic image like this, we cannot detect the fact that this is a little tiny white glint. We don't see it as glint. It just gets added in to the general light that is reflected from this entire area. Those white spots in the micrograph are not pinholes and they're not areas where the ink is not being taken up. Those white spots are areas where the surface is oriented such that the microscope is able to see the glint. Finally, we're at a point where we can answer the original question. Why is it that on coated stock, you can get a much richer color than on uncoated stock. Coated stock is very smooth. That means that all of the surface reflected light is gonna bounce off in basically the same direction. As a result, we're going to be able to see that glint. That glint occurs over a large enough area that the eye is gonna be able to discern areas where we have that surface reflection. Our brain will look at that and say, oh, we can disregard that. That's not part of the color of the object. For uncoated stock, we have basically the same amount of surface reflected light. The difference is that the areas that happen to be pointing toward the light source are at such a microscopic level that the eye is not capable of discerning them. And since the eye doesn't provide the information to the brain, the brain is not able to discount that and say, oh, that's glint, that's not part of the color of the object. And therefore, it looks like white has been added to the color of the object. It's all an illusion. I want to thank you for taking the time out of your day to watch this video. I've taken on a subject that I think is widely misunderstood, and I hope that I have provided a better way of understanding it.